All right, guys, here we are. Ramstein, Germany at the US Air Force Base at the Air Force and I'm sitting here with three-time national champion, two-time cadet world champion, and two-time world team member, Yanni Diakamahalas from the University of Cornell. And we are here for a sit-down, in-depth interview. Yanni, appreciate you, bro. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So let's start from the beginning. Tell me a little bit about how you got started into wrestling as a young man. So my dad just picked up wrestling in middle school wrestled through high school, through college. He was Division Three All-American. He would tell you he wasn't very good. <laughs> that would be the first thing he'd tell you. But what I think- What would you say? i say he's all right. Okay. Especially when you, he started late and, you know, he caught a lot of, like he was, he was a classic, just like tough guy, tried really hard, mm -hmm. probably didn't have great coaching, probably wasn't a phenomenal athlete. But I think he got a lot out of it psychologically and he kind of wanted that for me and my brothers. We were just talking about this like trying to create stressful environments without literally leaving your kid in one. Mm. That was kind of what he was going for. He's like, I can stress these guys out and challenge them mentally through wrestling. And if they're good, then that's cool. And we, it's not like we were really good athletes. So we weren't good at other sports. Oh, well, I met your mom a few years ago in Pittsburgh. She told me that you walked at eight months. Yeah, I did. So you were a pretty good athlete. I, I definitely walked young. My hand-eye was never good. So I was never, like I was good defense in football. I used to strike out in t-ball, like smacking the tee. I just, I was always, I feel like good with myself. Like I walked early. I was like the kid who was climbing up stuff and jumping mm. off stuff really young. But like, if you put a ball in my hand, I turned into a buffoon. <laughs> so my, my parents were like, wow, well, what's wrestling gonna do for him? And then I really liked it. I got super competitive about it. I took it really seriously. Yep. And then it became this like whole thing that- And how old were you then? I was five, but in the beginning, I'd go to like one or two practices a week, and sure. my dad probably had to bribe me to get me there. And then once I made some friends and they would go to tournaments, I started to want to go. So like the next year was when I started like wrestling matches. I was six or seven years old. Mm. Started actually wrestling in tournaments and stuff. And then yeah. even after that, we didn't really take it all that seriously until I was in late elementary school, like nine or 10 years old. Sure. It was probably when we started traveling out of state. That was when it really took off. Yeah. So your dad's phenomenal at development, right? You are who you are, amazing wrestler. Your brother Greg is a five-time state champion from the state of New York. And he's someone that I've looked to for advice, bringing young men and women up in this sport as well. And so I've given him a call, given him a call on multiple occasions, like, hey, Ilias, like, I love what you do, love what you've done with your boys. Give me some advice on this stage of life. My son Beacon, our oldest, is eight years old. And so he's just getting into the sport. He's been in it for about a year and a half. And so your dad's someone that I look up to. Tell me a little bit about some of the things that your dad did well and some of the things that he did poorly or that you would reverse if you were a father. So we kind of used me as a guinea pig. <laughs> and I feel like guinea pig is the right word because it was a lot of, we, like, we had these ideas. We, I was a little kid. My dad kind of had these ideas. Like, I think this is gonna work. And they, we probably hit more than we missed on a lot of them. But the one thing I think my dad did really well was, so there's this stereotype in wrestling in general that when your dad coaches you, you're gonna burn out. But a lot of that is because like the dad wants it more than the kid does. Mm. And I think with me, in the beginning, he definitely did. Because what, like when you're six or seven, you, you don't, don't, you don't care. You don't want <laughs> you anything. Want you want ice cream. Cartoons, yeah. And, yeah. But my dad, he understood how people worked so he'd bribe us and it wasn't big bribes it would be like hey if you come to practice let's see if we can get one of your friends to come hang out after mm. or like hey if you that's good if you wrestle you know if you wrestle hard today well let's let's uh let's go get ice cream after or something but it was it was always it was never a participation thing as much as it was effort probably started as participation and then once we were going regularly everything was based on performance more than outcome uh, so sure. like there's times where he has like lost it on me after winning, beating a really quality kid, but just wrestling bad or wrestling with fear or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And there's times where I've lost and he's like, hey, whatever. And we just walk out of it, nothing. But I think my dad was really, like he had a good long-term vision. He understood like, all right, being the best 10 year old wrestler doesn't matter, but let's get you on that track now. So he was playing the long game. Playing the long game. So like we used to talk about the classic analogy like I would get pinned, I would take you down four times and then get like headlocked to my back and pinned. Mm -hmm. That's like, that happened to me sometimes. 
And I'd be like, this is so stupid. Like, why don't I just do that? He'd be like, because headlocks work when you're 10 and single legs work forever. If you give them world-class uh, single leg. That's a great quote. That's and a great quote. that was like how we looked at it. And that completely changed my view of it. Because once I bought in, same with my brothers, once we bought in, it was like a no-brainer. Like, all those guys were just making stupid moves. We'll just figure out how to stop that and then you can keep going. Mm. Um, the only thing I would change, that we did a lot of, and part of this is like, what are you gonna do? We didn't know. So that's what I was saying. Is my dad wasn't this like world champ guy who had done it and knew how to do it. So there was a lot of stuff we would do it, try it, like ah, oh, it doesn't work, scratch it, come back to it, you know, do something else, and then maybe realize, all right, we should have gone back to the first thing the whole time. Sure. So there's a little bit of trial and error in there, but I would say at the end of it, we kind of have it like now we've got a pretty good grasp of it. But there was some scuffling around in the beginning for sure. Yeah. So you say you didn't take it seriously until late elementary school, but you were a cadet world champion two times in a row. So at 15, 16 years old, you were already the best wrestler in the world. I remember seeing you at the Olympic Training Center as a young yeah. man, and you were the guy that everyone was saying, hey, you got to watch this Yanni Diakamahalas kid. He's going to be great in the future. So tell me a little bit about how you got from that point as a young man, figuring it out through trial and error, to being the best in the world in just a few short years. I think there's two parts of it. So for one, I, I really liked it. I think the reason, so my dad coached a really small, probably a total in the whole time from when I started wrestling to right now, 20 kids, maybe. And I think of all of them, I probably enjoyed it the most. Like I, I was the most eager about the art of it. So yeah. I, like, I watched a lot of matches. I tried to get my friends to watch with me. And yeah. I, like, I really enjoyed that, which my skill set was, the way that they taught me how to wrestle, my dad, was just be the more skilled guy. Sure. So I kind of fell in love with this idea of knowing everything and watching everything. And it's a little bit of chicken or the egg, but either because of that, I had a really good aptitude for learning wrestling or the good learning aptitude what made me want to learn more. Mm. It's a little bit of that. But because of that, I think stuff clicked for me really quickly and it helped me move on to new things quickly and then you know, my progression rate was pretty high. Yeah. And I think looking back on it from a young age, the skill set that we had built for me was definitely catered more towards freestyle, even if I didn't know it. So your high intelligence wrestler had an aptitude for learning, you became a student of the sport, and that had to help you with your transition into being great academically, seeing as though you were able to choose Cornell what was kind of that process like going from being a two-time cadet world champion, I'm sure being recruited by everyone in the entire country to settling on a place like Cornell? Cornell had a lot of things before I even met the coaches that I liked about it. I liked this idea of a safety net because it's like, you don't know what's going to happen when you get to college. You might right. be done wrestling when you graduate. You might want to keep going or you might want to be completely uninvolved in the sport. You don't want to sure. coach nothing. So I like that. Cornell kind of gave me this opportunity where it's like, well, if I have to get a degree from Cornell, I'm able to do something. So on paper, and it was close to home, but it was still far enough away where it was like I was on my own. So there's some logistical things I really liked about it. And then when I got to meet the coaches, which at the time, yeah, there's only one left, but that's my guy. <laughs> it's Mike. Yep. I really got along with them, and I liked the environment that they had because I feel like generally – it's like the classic, oh, they're probably really smart wrestlers, probably not that tough. But Mike, like, tortured those guys. Mm. <laughs> I remember watching workouts, and I'm like, man, that sucks. That looks really hard. And they, at the time, when I was growing up, was like the Kyle Dake era. Like, Kyle won his fourth when I was 14. So I'm like, all right, I, they can do it. They can make it it's happen. possible. They can make it That's happen. That's huge. And, I, and then he was doing really well internationally. You know, through my recruiting process, he had some, he had some really quality wins. So I think it, it just was like... I don't even know if I understood in the moment that that was why, but I think that was a big factor was I was watching somebody do what I wanted to do and the whole time they could be like, you know what, this isn't for me and probably could have found a career in something completely different. Mm. And I think that that was really alluring to me. And I think that what I've seen, at least for most colleges, if you want to be, when you leave home, it's a 10-year plan. It's a 15-year plan, right? Yeah. No longer is it four or five years, I'm going to go here, 
go through this process of trying to become a national champion and then move on elsewhere, right? You get to yeah. this place where you're like, I'm going to stick around. I was in Lincoln for 15 years yeah. at the University of Nebraska under the same coach with Mark Manning, Brian Snyder, and just watching all the girls, or excuse me, all the guys around me kind of swirl in different spaces. But I was one of the mainstays yeah. of that program. So I feel like that's a unique position for you, for Kyle Dake. Um, talk to me a little bit about once you arrived there, because you started winning right away. Like, it wasn't this hiccup where you had to make this yeah. transitive period where you were taking your lumps early on in your career you immediately came in and you only had one loss as a freshman were an ncaa champion and then immediately started to compete on the freestyle scene what was that kind of like once you got to cornell so there's like a funny story about that coach cole i remember i'll never forget i was in like study hall at the end of the day i think it was my junior year and i get a call from like coach cole I'm like, all right, I should probably answer this. At this point, I'm already committed. I'm already going. Mm. The plan was for me to take that gray shirt gap year. He, Coach Cole calls me. I'm like, hey, what's up? He's like, hey, we were thinking about it, and you're not going to red shirt. <laughs> I was like, no? He's you're like, like no, no, you're ready. I was like, okay. He's like, all right, see you. Hung up, and that was like, it was this 10-second conversation. Like, dad, like, hey, they want me to wrestle. I'm wrestling right away. <laughs> no, and my dad, he'd probably be like, yeah, I know. We already talked about it. You're good. I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> but I feel like because of that, it was in my mind maybe a little earlier. And I remember Mike sat me down and this is a really interesting conversation because I've never had a conversation like that before really. So we sit there and he's like, hey, if the national tournament was wrestled today and it was a pure skills contest, you'd probably win. He's like, but if we wrestled the tournament today, you actually had to wrestle you'd probably take like sixth or seventh. What's that mean? Because up to this point, we talked about this earlier, my whole life, it's a skills contest. I'm the better guy, so I'm gonna win. Mm. And he's like, listen, you're good, but these college guys, they're strong, they're fast, they're in really good shape, they're tough, they wrestle hard. Those are things that, and he said, he's like, you're tough, but you don't, you're not imposing tough, you're resilient tough. It's like two different kinds mm. of things. You can take a lot, but you need to give it out sometimes too. We basically spent that whole year, obviously there was some skill stuff that we worked on. We added this whole arm dragon single leg thing to me, but the big thing was every day he'd give me like, hey, this is your challenge today, like you're gonna do it. And it would be like, how long can I hang from a pull up bar? How many rope climbs can I do without coming off? You know, am I gonna get a higher number on my bench this week in the lift, whatever it was. And it'd be Go different, Some, and sometimes it'd be wrestling. And on the day, and there was no cushion to it. Like if I didn't get it, he'd be like, "Yeah, you failed today. Make sure you forget that, or make sure you remember that. Come back again, try tomorrow." And then you is, gotta is like sit Mike? on it. This Mike. is Mike. That's doing this. It's all Mike. A whole year. Every time I wrestled, he'd grab me and be like, "Hey, you have to do this today. And if you don't do it, then you failed today. Hmm. I don't care about the whole workout." And I'd be like, "Okay." And throughout that, you know, I think I figured it out a little bit, and I kind of, because then I made a pretty big jump. Yeah. I had that real close match in the beginning of the year with this guy from Northern Iowa. I kind of blew it open. I majored him. Josh like, Albert. Yeah, and I majored him like a month later. And I just like basically tried harder. Mm. That was really what I needed. I needed to be more imposing and attacking with those guys. And so national champion your freshman year. And it was kind of poetic justice because you had went through this growth phase and instantly you got to see the fruit of your labor, right? Yeah. You're like, damn. It came right away. This works, <laughs> yeah. right? And so Mike became your guy you instantly started to cling to him because you knew that he was a guy that you could trust, he would be in your corner and he would fight for you. And so now three years into your career, all of a sudden there's this big transition. Stanford wrestling is about to get pulled from the shelf and then all of a sudden Rob Cole decides to take the job and Mike Gray becomes the head coach at Cornell. Tell me a little bit about that transition. So for a long time, like no one knew what was gonna happen. When we all understood Coach Cole was gonna retire soon. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like we all knew, all right, Coach Cole's gonna retire and then this guy's gonna take it. Yeah. So when he retired, there was this kind of like, all right, what's gonna happen? No one really knew. You didn't know if Mike was gonna be the guy? We, we the wrestlers, were like, it should be Mike. Because he was the only coach left. The next guy, if Mike left, would have been Kyle, who at the time was like, I'm not I don't, I don't wanna do that. Not ready. Not ready, I wanna keep competing. Like, you can't be the head coach and compete. Mm. And like, we were like, don't bring someone in. Let's just have it be Mike. And the athletic director, it helps. You know, Mike's a Cornell alum. He had coached a guy in the NCAA finals almost every year he had been on staff between whoever he was working with year by year. So he had, he had done a good job. He got the job. 
And then immediately, it was like him and Kyle calling me back and forth, like, hey, who do you think we should bring in? And it was Mike being like, I think this, this, and this guy. Kyle being like, I think these guys. And then they would talk to each other and be like, hey, we talked and we're gonna come up with these guys. What do you think? And whatever. And they, what they did was they ended up bringing in Donnie Vincent, yep. Kellen Russell, and Nick Wisdowski. And on the, outside, on the outside looking in, it probably just seems like you pick guys, but I wasn't a part of the decision-making process like I was making the decisions, but I got to, because there were no other coaches, I kind of got to listen to Mike talk it out. And you had some input into yeah. the process. Yeah, and I, what he did what made sense to me. Because, so what happened was when you're the head coach, like he wants to keep coaching, he still does. He runs some workouts, gets in the room, but there's a lot of other responsibilities. So you need one or two guys that you can lean on for that, which That's is right. Kellen and Donnie. And even Gwiz can. And then Donnie's this really regimented, logistical guy. He came up with a whole recruiting log. You have to send in how many times a week this kid gets called. And they came up with this thing when he was at NC State that the kids who got called this many times had this high of a percentage of coming to NC State. And he's like, let's try to get this going again. So that, I think, helped because it created a lot of order because we had so much turnover. It was kind of like, what's going on? Mike's doing a job of four as one guy. Yeah. And then... Kellen is like the wrestling guy. He does a ton of individuals. He runs a lot of the workouts. Him and Donnie go back and forth. He does a lot of the, like, when the parents are here, he does a lot of that stuff. So, and he's kind of like the player's coach. Everyone really likes Kellen. Not like they don't like Mike and Donnie. They like Mike and Donnie. But Kellen's like the funny one, the nice one, the one who's making jokes with the guys in the corner, like that kind of guy. And then Gwiz, being the guy who's still competing, I think he's really good for those upper weights because he can teach him how to wrestle like a heavyweight. I think heavyweight's one of those sports, this is a joke that me and my dad have, heavyweights are like, heavyweights in wrestling are like kickers in the NFL, where they're playing the same sport, but it's a completely different skill set. Yeah. To, to be a successful heavyweight, you can't wrestle like we do. Of course. And it, you can't wrestle like a heavyweight in our weights. Sure. So having a guy who's experienced that and actually wrestles heavyweight, I think was really, really valuable for our big guys. And you can see it, Luis Fernandez had a really good year. Mm. He was one nosebleed away from being an All-American. I think he wrestled our guy. Yeah, he did. He, Christian Lance in the round of 12. He had a dude flat with both legs in mm. with like 30 to go. Stalemate. Bloody nose. Oh, no. He, he had the bloody nose. I think the, the other Nebraska guy did. guy did, I think. And then the guy escaped on the whistle start and took him down in overtime for the win. But I'm like, oh. He's like a top wrestler. Mm. Rides legs. But he's, I mean, he got a lot better over that year. I think Wiz was really instrumental. So I think, you know, the, the guys that Mike brought in, I think all were very purposeful. Mm. So that was good. Good, man. Good. Exciting time. So second world team, made your first world championship team last year in Oslo, Norway. You were really close to doing it in 2019. Had some controversy. Uh, talk a little bit about last year's world championship. I know it wasn't the performance that you expected or hoped for. Um, but just tell me a little bit about how you were feeling leaving Oslo last year. You know, I think for a long time, the narrative with me was, oh, you just got to make the team and you're going to do good when you get there. And that was an overestimation of how good I was and an underestimation of how good those guys are. Because I had beaten those guys. I had beaten Musakayev, I had beaten Bajrang, I had beaten these other guys who medaled in European championships and world championships. But there's a difference between beating one here and one there and beating them consecutively. That's what you guys do that makes it so hard is you beat this guy and then this guy and then this guy all in 24 hours. Yeah. So I think for me, I was an incomplete wrestler last year. You know, there were some things I did really, really well and some things I did really poorly. What were you missing? I wasn't tight enough. I, I wasn't willing to win a match two to one, which is an underrated skill mm. because some guys you can only score on one time which means they can't score on you at all. And if you look at the guy who beat me, he wins every match two to one. He doesn't do anything. He wins the shot clock game. He gets a push out. He gets a reattack. And just every match is like that. He's going to attack fall in the first period because you stink or he's going to beat you three to one. And I think that, you know, with me, if you look back at it, he scored three times off my action because I felt like there needed to be points on the board. And that's not to say that I'm going to stall, but I need to be able to crack a guy for five minutes just to score on the five and a half minute. That's right. And that's what, like if you watch your matches, 
It's a lot of zero zero one zero first periods that turn into eight zero. Sure. You watch a lot of guys are like that. Gilman's like that. Dave Taylor's like that. Where it's slow, slow, slow. They're working it down, working it down, and then suddenly it like bursts open. Whereas with me, I'm almost doing it so early that they're just jumping on it, and I need to be able to build that and spend more time beating them up on the front end. And so, do you feel like you've made those adjustments? I do. I think. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> we're we're a week out for me, exactly one week from today. So yeah. we will definitely see. But I feel really confident. I think yeah. we've been we've done a good job addressing the holes for me. Yeah. So it's been man a ridiculous amount of years. 2006 was the last time that we won a medal at this weight class. 66 kilos was Bill Zadig, our head coach now. And so it's been 16 years since we've won a medal at this weight class. And you are the guy primed and in position to do it. Do you feel any additional pressure going into this World Championships, or do you feel poised for a great performance? No, I feel good about it. I think this is one of those things that's it's probably a hot take. Mm. I think the concept of legacies are for people that aren't doing them. Mm. Like, I don't, I mean, you probably, when you're done, you're going to look back and be like, that was crazy. But not while you're in but it. But when you're doing it, you're not like, how's this going to affect my legacy? Mm. You're just, you're doing it. And whatever comes of it, comes of it, right? I think that that's a thing that people get hung up on is like, I want to create this big story. I want to create this big, being a world champ is a big moment. Mm-hmm. I don't care if it's the most boring, uninteresting world title ever. It's a huge, dramatic thing you just did. Best in the world, bro. You're the best wrestler in the world. And because of that, like all, you know, the medal drought, you're the first guy to medal since the coach. I, that stuff is really cool, but it's only cool if you actually do it. Mm. So it's, some, it's like counting your chickens before they hatch a little bit. So how are you staying relaxed and calm and present in the moment? You know, I, this is kind of a theme in this talk now, is I really, I really do enjoy wrestling. It's something I really enjoy. Mm. If, if I didn't do it at this level, it would be a hobby for me to learn about. So I just try to get sucked into it a little bit. And not, not wrestling media, but the art of wrestling. Because yeah. there's a lot of wrestling media because, you know, there's Flow, there's UWW, there's all the people on social media, there's wrestling forums. There's all sorts of yeah. things that you can look to to hear people talk about you. But that's not really the art of it. That's just the, the presentation. But I, so I just enjoy wrestling. I try to enjoy that as much as I can, make it about the, the art of it, yeah. if that makes any sense. Yeah, I got two more things for you before we wrap up. Your two favorite wrestlers currently competing and your two favorite wrestlers of the past oh, don't make me pick guys that are still wrestling you, push, you can pick all russians <laughs> <laughs> i'll go with my two favorite from the past okay i was like a diehard john smith fan as a kid mm. i used to like watch a bunch of videos me and my dad were like john smith nerds which is funny because you're like well why don't you go to oklahoma state well for different reasons sure but i like we were like i loved how he wrestled i liked because one thing, too, that gets overlooked, the same thing with a lot of guys today, like you and, you know, a lot of our wrestlers is, like, he wrestled so hard. Mm. He wrestled so hard. He was in phenomenal shape. To do what he did this high off the ground sure. for the whole match is incredibly hard. Face and conditioning. It's a lot. And he was, like, a tough dude. Like, he just, he was awesome. He was really good. The other one I really liked was uh, Buvai Sar Satiev. Of course. was, like... If wrestling was an art, he was yeah. Picasso. When you think of an artist, yeah, he, you think yeah. he's quintessential yeah. when you think of wrestling. He lo- and like everything was so effortless, but he was wrestling hard at the same time. Mm-hmm. It was it was awesome. And I know it's like, oh, he's Russian. But like I said, I'm trying to make it as much about the beauty of it as I can. Yeah. He, his wrestling was awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Well, if you were thinking, if you were an artist, let's say you're in artistry and into works, I wouldn't ask you to pick, hey, who are your favorite American artists? You think of who are the best artists of all time, whether it's Pablo Picasso, Salvador Dali, Diego Sanchez, like all these guys. You get it. So, like, um, post-world championships, you've become a world champion. Congratulations, Yanni Diakamahalas. I want to take you out to get you a meal. Any meal of your choice, it's on me. Where are we going? I got no diet rules to follow. I'm, like, torn. There's two things that I really enjoy. One of them is like really good Italian food, like spaghetti and meatballs and stuff, but it's got to be good. Because my grandmother on my mom's side makes good Italian food, so my standards are a little high. Yep. Or like a really nice like southern barbecue meal, like 
like mm. true southern barbecue i think is awesome they're completely different very different i i completely understand the spaghetti one because of my grandma and my mom the barbecue one i don't know i just really like it <laughs> considering your dad's into seafood are you not a seafood guy i eat it all the time and seafood is one of those things that i can eat when i'm cutting weight so the, it's like i've learned i i really enjoy novelties mm. things that you can't have all the time what about for dessert I'm a big ice cream guy ice really cream. like cookie dough ice cream what about you uh that's a good question let's flip it back on the interview I'm a, I'm a, i would probably say i'm a pastry guy like i would do like, like a donut like a donut that would be like if someone what? bought me a box do you like of those donuts. boston cream donuts or like the no, traditional simple gla- just traditional like, cake donuts cinnamon sugar that's just good like stuff. super simple a friend of mine was like a donut guy he loved donuts he, he's graduated this past year and we like found this thing he ended up not doing it but you can do like donut of the month and they send uh, you like different donuts. We can never. That's do not that. good for us. We can never do that. <laughs> but there's it's a like hypothetical. A subscription, bro. He's got the Flow Pro, the Donut he's got, Pro. He's got donut <laughs> pro. <laughs> he sends you a, a box of donuts every week. There's a hype, there's a parallel universe where donuts are coming to your house every day. But you're definitely not going to be a world champion. No, you're not a world champion that one. Well, hey Yanni, bro, I appreciate you taking the time, man, for coming and sitting no. down with me. This Thank was you. awesome. Hopefully, the fans get a chance to enjoy it at home. Stay tuned. We're going to try to grab as many world team members as we can over the next week as we lead into the world championships for 2022 in Belgrade, Serbia. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and have a great day. See you guys. That was good.